lessons that we talk about today, there's three of them, that they're not going to be earth shattering. They are not. If you're thinking, oh wow, I'm gonna, I better get my, I better sharpen my pencil, I better get my pen out because he's gonna give us. No, I'm not. The three points that we're gonna make in and of themselves, you've heard before in some shape, form, or fashion, but today I I beg you, I, I earnestly beg you to open your minds to the practical lessons that we look at at the end. It will, if you allow it, it will change your life. And I don't care what age you are. I don't care if you're the youngest person in this room or the oldest person in this room. These lessons and really grasping the truth of the lessons can change your life. And really that's why we're here. Say amen if you agree with that. <laughs> uh, that was healthy. Thank you. The reason why I go into that, uh, the chapters and verses, is because if you look at verse 1, chapter 12, we read it. It begins at, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. When you, the very beginning of that, that verse says, And at that time. So what is it? It's referring back to the things that were written in chapter 11. Right? It says, and at that time, well, at what time? Well, the stuff we just read out of chapter 11. So the division, the division of that, you know, of, of, of the writing there, maybe is not in such a great place, but it's fine. It all works together. So we're going to go back into chapter 11, and we're going to talk about a few verses there to get an idea of what, of what verse 1 means when it says, and at that time. Well, at the time that was referred to back in chapter 11. We're going to start there and uh, with our sermon. Father, bless us now, please. Holy Spirit of God, teach us. I pray that you will help me to make this clear and, and, and help my thoughts to be clear, easily uh, understood and digestible. And then, uh, obviously, uh, Holy Spirit of God, work in our lives through this sermon. Encourage us, challenge us, convict us, whatever the need is. I pray that will be accomplished. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. First, we're going to look at the willful king. If you have your Bible, turn back to chapter 11 and look at verse 36. And we're going to look at 36, 37, 38, and 39 before we jump back to uh, chapter 12. Verse 36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. We know that's Jehovah, the God of gods. And there are no other gods besides, besides the God. And shall prosper till the ind indignation be accomplished. The word indignation there just refers to the tribulation till, that's, till that is over. For that, for that, that is determined uh, shall be done. The king. Who is it talking about the king? It's not talking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about the king of this world. It's talking about the prince of the power of the air. It's talking about the devil. It's talking about, actually it's talking about uh, the Antichrist right here. And the rule of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, when he comes, I'm, I, I don't have time to go back and retrace everything this morning, but as he becomes the world leader, this will be his attitude. This is who he is. He will exalt himself. He will magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and, sh and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. What does that tell you about the Antichrist? That he will be a Jew. He will not regard the God of his fathers. What that is in reference to is the God of his fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Antichrist will be a Jew. Nor, he will not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. And what that means is, he will not regard and have no, 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 uh, 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 
you know, special affinity for God nor God's Son, Jesus Christ. That's who's being referred to there in that phrase, the desire of women. Before Christ was born, it was the desire of Jewish, of the, of the Jews. Every woman said, maybe I will become the chosen vessel through which Christ will be born. So that was the desire of women back in that time, was to be, was to be Mary. Was to be the, the vessel that God chooses. And the Bible says that the Antichrist, he didn't regard God, capital G there. He didn't regard the God of his fathers. He's a Jew, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nor does he regard, have any regard for Jesus Christ. The desire, excuse me, the desire of women. Nor regard any God, little g there. But that's any other man-made God. He professes he professes uh, uh, faith in nobody but who? Himself. For he shall magnify who? Himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now, there will be an entity that comes along that he does say, that person is God. And who's being referred to here is the God of forces. Some people say that that can be better understood as a God of fortresses. Whatever, uh, it, it's six and one half dozen, another to me. The God of forces is Satan. Remember when he, when he attempted Jesus after the 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, he offered to Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world. Remember that? If you'll fall down in what? Worship me. And we talked about the word worship means to surrender. That's what worship is. It's not this. It's not singing praises to God. That's singing praises to God. Worship is surrender. And we know that. Satan said, if you'll fall down, kneel, surrender to me, to worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. That's what's being uh, uh, referred to here. When the Antichrist, when Satan actually comes to this earth, he will indwell the Antichrist. And the Antichrist does then acknowledge Satan as a, a god, the god of this world, and who can give to him all of the kingdoms, all of the forces, all of the military might and strength of the world. Satan says, I can give that to you. And so he, he, uh, he, he the Antichrist, uh, he regards that. But his estate uh, shall he honor, the, uh, but in his estate, or, or in Jehovah's place is what that means. But in Jehovah's place, you could say, shall he honor the God of forces. That's Satan. And, and a God whom his fathers knew not, shall, uh, knew not shall he honor with gold uh, and with silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And, his, uh, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. First, we're talking about the willful king when the Bible says there that this king who is the Antichrist uh, makes the statement that and the king shall do according to his will. Next, now we're going we're to jump from there uh, for time's sake and jump at, at, at we're going to look at uh, Dan, Jan, Daniel chapter 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up. So now we're going to look at Michael. Michael's only mentioned in one verse here. And uh, we've read it and I'll read it again. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great pit prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. A time of trouble. And that's the title of our sermon is a, a, a time of trouble. Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. We're talking about Michael. We're talking about the archangel, the warrior angel, uh, uh, the, the great Michael stands up at that time. And I believe that his... Now look, I'm going to tell you from this point forward, and even what I've already covered, you know, uh, everybody has an opinion on them. And I have, look, I have done a lot of reading. I have read 
so many opinions and so many people that have said, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a theologian, I'm a scholar, and, and this is what I think these things mean. And there's a lot of different ways to look at these. I'm giving you the one today that I feel is the correct one. I mean, that's my, that's my responsibility, is to give you the correct view of, of these verses and who's being talked about and what's being said. Understand this, though. There's nothing in this Bible that promises us that we can understand everything in the book of Daniel. We're going to get to that later on. We'll get to it. And Bible tells, uh, God tells uh, uh, Daniel, now that you've done writing book, shut it up. Seal it up. And Daniel basically says, but I don't even understand it. And he says, it's not for yours to understand. It's not for you to, it's for people later. It's actually, primarily, it's for my people. It's for the Jews. It's for the Jews in the time of, uh, during the time of uh, tribulation. Many of them are going to, as they see what's happening around them, and as they still read the scripture, they're going to say, oh my goodness, we've missed it this whole time. We've been thinking that the Messiah didn't come. The Messiah has come. And everything has is, 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 is happened exactly the way that God said it would happen in the book of Daniel. And many, basically the Jews are going to come back to God during the tribulation. Now, with the, with the writing of the New Testament, with Matthew, Matthew 24, with the book of Revelation, it does shed incredible insight on the book of Daniel. But there are some things in here that I will tell you I've scratched my head over. I'm going to give you some reasoning. I'm going to give you just what I think it might mean, like when it talks about the, the 1,260 years. Well, I know what that means. That's three and a half, I'm sorry, 1,260 days. That's three and a half years if you do the math, looking at the, uh, the Jewish calendar being 360 days per year, not 365 like we have in our calendar. You multiply that out and you get 1,260. But what about the, um, what about the 1,290 days that is supposed of in the end of this chapter. What does that mean? <clears throat> what about the 1,335 days that's spoken of in the verse immediately following the 1,290 days? What does that mean? I'm going to give you what I think it means. But it's, but it's really based on what seems logical to me. God has not revealed that to us. There are things that we are still learning about uh, the book of Daniel and the deep prophecy. And those things I hope to get in even more in our series, you know, beginning in the new year. So now we're talking about Michael the Archangel. During the last half of the tribulation, the last three and a half years, the tribulation is the 70th week of Daniel's uh, prophecy. And it's, 70 year, it's seven years. It's called, the last three and a half is called the Great Tribulation or the time of trouble. Everything ch changes as God shows up. Everything up to that point, there has been peace in the world under the leadership of the Antichrist. He solves everybody's problems. He's even made a covenant with Israel, a covenant of peace with Israel. But at, the, at three and a half years into the tribulation, all of that changes. And it is literally hell on earth at that point as God pours out His wrath upon the Antichrist and as, as the Jews are, will, be a, uh, 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 will suffer persecution unlike at any other time in their nation. And they have been through a lot. Six million were killed during what? Right, Holocaust, World War II. And we see of all the, the persecution <clears throat> that they have been through in the, in the book, in the Bible. But compared to what they will go through in the tribulation, God says not gonna, not, it can't hold a patch to it. Do you, do you understand that, Daniel? <laughs> I say these things, you know, and Daniel laughs at me sometimes. He said, where would you come up with that? In other words, what they're going to go through in the tribulation will be unlike anything they have ever been through. Michael the Archangel shows up. It doesn't talk a lot about why he shows up, what it means when he stands up. Uh, as I get into the lessons at the end, I'm going to speak more about that and uh, what I think it means. God will roll out his wrath upon the world and the government of the Antichrist. Hence, he sends Michael the Archangel, as described in Jude 9, talks about Michael being the angel uh, that, that watches over Israel. Israel. Verse 2, 
is the a national resurrection. I don't have time to explain that to you. I could take 30 minutes and do it, but we don't have time, and we will do that in the Sunday night series. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is a national resurrection of the nation of Israel during the tribulation. Okay? And, uh, and like I said, that's all I'm going to say about it this morning. And we'll talk more about that later. Number three is the wise. Now we talked about the wise. Uh, last week we preached a sermon on it. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Who are these people? They are soul winners. Now this verse particularly is speaking of soul winners during the tribulation. About people that are the Jews and they're going now with the truth. And they get saved and, and they're going around preaching to other Jews. And, and, and trying to get other Jews saved. And they are going to be saved as a number of the sands of the, the seas. You know many many and basically the nation will turn back to God at that time and these soul winners are that's referring to Jews during that period but as we talked about last week uh, it also would, would appeal would uh, apply to soul winners in any age um, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that when his souls is wise wise so, the people that, it, that that's referring to are soul winners, particularly as it, as, it, uh, as it applies to Israel. They are the people that are winning souls during the tribulation. Number four, the closing of the book. This is what I mentioned a minute ago. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. What is that referring to? I believe that that's referring to the witnesses during the end that will take this book and will fully understand it. Maybe you and I cannot understand everything about it because some things are still they're mysteries to us. But they will not be during the tribulation. And the Jews are going to take this information and, and, the, and the revealed prophecy as it is totally revealed to the Jews during the tribulation. And they are going to understand it and they are going to come to God and they are going to run to and fro. Their knowledge of the scripture is going to be increased and they are going to take that knowledge and bring a nation back to God. The three and a half years, now look at verse 5, And then I, Daniel, looked and beheld there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters, that's different than being on the bank of the river, right? He's upon the waters. What does that mean? That means he's out in the middle of the river, and he's walking on the water. Who have we seen do that in Scripture? Jesus. This is Jesus now. Verse end of verse six. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Uh, the one angel asked the son. The angel doesn't know, and he asked Jesus, "How long is it going to be to all these things come to an end?" Verse 7, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven. He did this right here. And he swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, a times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. We're focusing there on Jesus saying, I'll tell you how long it's going to be. It's going to be three and a half years. That's what, the, that's what those words, a time, referring to one year, a times, referring to two more years, and a half, referring to half a year. If you multiply uh, those number of months, which is, what is that, uh, 12, 24, 30 months, times 360 days, you know what you get? 1260 days. You get three and a half years. Now, from what point? And we've, we, I think that we've covered this before, but if not, from the time that the Antichrist comes into Jerusalem, into Palestine, and sets up his 
tabernacle, the Bible says, meaning tent. He takes up his, his place right there between the seas, meaning between the Mediterranean Sea and between the uh, Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. He's going to set his tent up right there. He's going to take over. This is three and a half years into the tribulation. All hell's going to break loose. And he says, fine, I'm taking over everything. And he offers a pig on the on the uh, on the temple at the uh, you know on the temple altar, which is an abomination to God. And he's going to set up his throne there, and he will rule, rule from there. From the time that he does that, that's called the abomination of desolation. From the, and uh, remember Antiochus Epiphanes that we talked about. Okay, maybe a little bit, kind of foggy in there. He was a type of the Antichrist. He did the same thing. But he was a type. He was a symbol. He was a picture of something that would happen one day in, in, in completeness. And that's what the Antichrist does. Three and a half years into the tribulation, he says, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take the sacrifice away from the God's people. I'm going to take their hope away. I'm going to take their relationship away. They will not have a relationship with the God who I have no regard for, I'm going to cut that off. Everybody's going to be the same and they will all worship me. From that day that that officially happens to the end of the tribulation is 1260 days. It is three and a half years. Say amen if you're with me so far. Amen. amen. You're not, are you? <laughs> okay. No, I know you are. I believe you are. So, the three and a half years, it's mentioned there. Verse 8, And I heard, but I understood not. Daniel says, I'm hearing you, but I'm not understanding, just like many of you. <laughs> and, 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 and I like to joke around. I, look, I know, that, I know that we are going you know, over the book of Daniel at, at, at breakneck speed in some cases because we just don't have the time on a Sunday morning. But we're going to take that time in January, all right? But, uh, but right now, I know that some people are kind of lost. I get it. And, if I, and, and sometimes when I'm up here teaching it, I get lost in it. So I understand. Daniel said, I hear what you're saying, but I don't understand. What are you talking about? So he said, Oh, my Lord. What shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of time. How about that for an answer? Have you ever went to God in prayer about some suffering, some great tragedy in your life, some, some, you know, some big deal? I mean, it's a big deal. Loss of life. You know, uh, 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 and, and look, and I know many of your lives in here, and I know that you have suffered greatly in time. Have you ever went to God and said, What's, what is all this about? And, and did the answer sort of come back to you like, never mind. Trust me. You just trust me. I'll tell you later. We'll open this book up later. But Daniel, this book, this, this, especially talking about the tribulation and the end times, it was never for you to know. In other words, the things that, that are coming, well, I won't go there, but the governments that, that God gave him visions about, yes, you're going to see that come to pass. Uh, in, you know, uh, uh, a lot of it in your own lifetime. But this here that we're talking about, it's, it's not for you. It's for my nation. It's for the Jews. It's for your people. In the 70th week. So don't worry about it. Don't worry yourself about it. Look, I got this. Don't, don't concern yourself with it. By the time it happens, you're going to be in heaven. You'll be in heaven by, the, by that time. And you'll see it. You'll be with me. That's what faith is about. It's trusting God when we are uncertain, is it not? It's trusting God when we pray and we don't get that answer. It's just stay, you stay the course. Why? Because of your faith. Because of your faith. Now, look at um, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. That means many people are going to get saved during, this, during the tribulation. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Verse 11, and from, that, from the time uh, that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. That's halfway through the tribulation. That's when the Antichrist takes over the temple. 
the time of sacrifice will be taken away at that time. He said, from that time, uh, and the abomination that maketh desolate, the abomination of desolation set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Thirty more days than three and a half years. Three and a half years multiplied, uh, mo three and a half years multiplied by twelve. No, I'm not, I'm not getting that right. Twelve hundred and sixty days. Okay, which is three and a half years of days. Okay, 1260 days. Now it says 1290 days. What does that mean? You can read on. It does not give us what the meaning is. I'm going to tell you what I think it is. Maybe this is crocodology. File it under there. Put a note. This is what the pastor said. I don't know. And a lot of people out there in the world, the great minds of Bible scholars, they don't know either. They all differ. It could mean that the 30 days from 1260 to 1290 days that is talked about in verse 11, that could be the time that it takes for, for, uh, for the Antichrist to in, not only initiate the takeover of the religious worship, but also complete it. There are people that say they could refer to 30 days before he actually offers the pig's blood on the, on the altar and he, and he takes charge and says, everybody will worship me. Okay. That's an idea. Read on. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand, uh, cometh to the thousand, three hundred, five, three hundred and five and thirty days. Thirteen hundred and thirty days. Thirty-five days. It's like, well, the twelve hundred and sixty, I got that. That's three and a half years. And that's not only spoken of here, it's spoken of in other places in the scripture. Okay, I get that. Then you throw out there the... The 1290 days, well, that's 30 days more than the 1260. Well, there's a reason there. I just gave you. Maybe that's how long it took the Antichrist to set up the takeover of the religious system. Possible. Do I know that to be true? I do not. The 1335 days. That's 45 more days now than the 1290. Are you following me? What does that mean? Maybe that's maybe the 45 days after after Jesus returns, maybe it takes Jesus 45 days to fully set up his government on this earth. I know, right. That's what I look. This is what I'm looking for. Maybe I'm okay if you say I don't believe that. I'm okay with that. I'm not I'm not telling you that that's truth. I'm telling you this the Bible never contradicts itself and somebody say amen. amen. And there's a reason. And there's a reason that we don't know. And there's a reason that Daniel didn't know. And we still don't know. But the reasons will be revealed one day, most likely in the tribulation, as to why these days, the days that are numbered are different. That it starts with three and a half years, which is 1260 days, and then it mentions 1290 days, and then it mentions 1335 days. And there's a reason there. And we will know these things in the end. We don't know them now. I'm just giving you some plausible explanations to it. But understand, when he told Daniel, you shut the book and you seal it up, and the people in the end time will understand it fully. And they will run to and fro, witnessing with this knowledge. And their knowledge will be increased. They're going to understand things that we don't understand. And they're going to be... They're going to be witnesses on steroids during the tribulation. The Jews are going to be getting saved. and They're going to be sharing the gospel. And they're going to be getting saved by the hundreds of thousands and even millions. And that's an exciting time. We should be excited that the Jews will come back to God during the tribulation. God says the tribulation is about the Jews. It's not really about the Antichrist. It's about the Jews. And I'm using the Antichrist to persecute. I'm going to allow him to persecute my people that will turn them back to me. And that's a great thing. Now, I have three lessons for you about faith. 
And, and, and you say, well, where do you get these? And I'm just going to tell you, God's, God basically, you know, as I'm reading through the 13 verses of Daniel chapter 12, I'm thinking, God, what do you want me to, <laughs> where do you want me to land on this? I, I got to have something practical. You know, I don't believe in just giving information, praying a prayer and, and leaving. I believe in trying to make something practical, something that, that, that the Holy Spirit can speak to you about. And, uh, okay, so God says, okay, look at verse 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And the Holy Spirit spake to me and says, I want you to talk about that for just a couple minutes. The how long. How many of you, and don't raise your hands, but how many of you have been in, maybe you're in it now. Maybe you've been through it. And look, if we just knew how long it was going to last, we could plan if we could write on a calendar that as of this day right here, it's all going to be over. That would make a lot of suffering more tolerable for us. Now he does in this scripture here, he does, uh, Jesus talks about the three and a half years. But listen, but for Daniel, Daniel didn't understand any of it. As often we don't understand suffering and trials. God's going to reveal Himself to you at the right time about the hardship. He will because He is a good God. Amen. Amen. And He will reveal it to you. But often in the early stages we're like, how long am I going to have this cancer? How long am I going to have this broken relationship? How long is this going to happen in my child's life? Is that going to happen in my granddaughter's life? My grandchild's life? You know, how long, how, how long, God? If I just knew how long I'd be, <coughs> I, I, I feel like I could deal with this better. And God says, no. What you need to do is trust me. You need to have faith. That's what you need. You don't need to know how long. You need to have faith. The lessons that we're going to look at today are about faith. I have three of them. Three lessons on faith. It's in your, it's in your handout. Number one, the foundation of the believer's confidence in God is faith. Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. The faith that you have, that you put in Jesus Christ, was given to you by God. God meets our every need. And He says, you're going to need faith to believe in My Son, and I'm going to get that. I'm going to give that to you, if you will exercise it. There's no getting around this. Either we accept God's gift of eternal life by faith, through the faith that God has given to us, and we continue our lives... In faith, or we suffer the consequences of a life wasted due to our unbelief. God is omniscient. He alone is omniscient. What does that mean? It means that He knows everything and He always has known everything. If we are to follow Him, we must trust His understanding of all things to guide us through each day. Hey, what's coming around the corner? I don't know. But guess who does? God knows. He's already made up a way. He's already thought about you. He's already preparing you for that thing that awaits you around the corner. But it takes faith to trust God. For the, around the corners that we can't see. For the things that we're going to go through that are not on the radar now. We're always looking at our radars and, and, and these things do not pop up until they're right in front of our face. And God says you need faith. The faith that got you saved will be the faith that, 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 uh, that, uh, that grants you, that, that helps you experience a wonderful life. With God. Understand this. The Bible teaches us that God's actions in our lives and in this world are perfect. Perfect. Never making mistakes and are always intended for our good. Point number two. The fundamental characteristic of faith is uncertainty. That's what makes it faith. It's, it's, it's the unknown. It's the not seen. It's the things that are not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1 says what? Now faith is the substance of things 
hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. The uncertainty, the not knowing, is what makes it faith. We have the statement that seeing is, seeing is believing. Not so with God. God says, no, the just shall live by faith. That statement is made like four times in the Bible. The just shall live by faith. I don't see it. The just shall live by faith. I don't understand it. The just shall live by faith. I'm uncertain about it. The just shall live by faith. The fact that you are uncertain, the fact that we have some doubts sometimes, is the very proof is what makes our trust and belief in God is what makes it faith-based. At the heart of faith lies a fascinating truth. It thrives in the realm of uncertainty. Embracing the unknown is what makes belief truly powerful. When you have to see it to believe it, you're in for a rough road. We're in for a rough road when we look at God and say, Hey, i got to see it before I take that step. And God says, Well, good luck with that because you're not going to. You need to step out by faith. Step out. I'm there. I mentioned this a lot. Remember the, the priests that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant over, over the Jordan River? They were going to... They were, they were, they were going to cross over into the promised land after wandering in the wilderness for how many years? Just want to see if you're with me. Forty years. And Joshua said, step out. And they said, well, the water's there. He said, step out. God said, step out. You step out. And they said, but the water's there. We're going to, we're going to fall in the water. And it's, we don't care about us. The Ark of the Covenant that has the, the pot of manna in it and Aaron's budded rod and the Ten Commandments, it's going to fall into the water. And Joshua said, God said, step out. And the priest said, okay, fine. Okay, fine. And when the soles of their foot touched the water, the water, poof, the water was held up on the upside of the stream, the river. The water was held up right there. The other waters vanished down the river and there was dry ground and they walked across. That's faith. It's not seeing. It's taking the steps when you can't see. Back to Michael for a moment. The wording of Daniel 12 and the events of the time of trouble seem similar to me or familiar to me. And I relate them to the stoning of Stephen. What made me relate those two events together? It's because the Bible says that Michael, Michael is going to do what? Stand up. He's going to stand up. Well, that's, an, that's, that's strange. So he's going to stand up. Well, I remembered, okay. In Acts chapter 7, the Bible talks about the stoning of Stephen. And while he is being stoned, he had just preached a rip-roaring sermon to the high priest and the high council. And they said, enough of this guy. we got to kill him. And they started stoning him, and they were killing him. And let me tell you what, what he saw, what Stephen saw. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. They, they railed on Stephen. Verse 55, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Amen. See how the two relate? When Stephen was going through the, the, the worst time of his life, he's being murdered. He looks up and the, and the clouds were parted and there stands Jesus. St Jesus stood up and stood and he's looking right at Stephen saying, you hang in there. I've got all of this. What is Michael the archangel doing? I think he's doing the same thing. When he stands up during the tribulation, I think the people, I think the Jews will see it and they will say, hey, there's Michael the archangel. He has, <coughs> he has come to deliver the Israelites. And what he does, he preserves the nation of Israel. Antichrist wants to wipe it off the map, wants to destroy it, wants to, 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 to uh, uh, drop the nuclear bomb on it and totally obliterate it. And Michael says, not on my watch. 
And that's God's message to you today. Not on His watch. The children of Israel will be will be, will be uh, protected, protected and preserved. There are going to be those during the tribulation that get saved and do not take the mark of the beast and they will die. They will be martyred. But the nation of Israel itself is going to experience a resurrection during that time and Michael is there to assist that. Why? Because he is the angel of Israel. He is the one that God says, yeah, uh, you, you, you'll, do, you'll, you'll do a lot of things, but your primary job... Uh, is to watch over Israel and make sure that my will is accomplished in the life of my people. And what I, and I want to relate that to you and I this morning. God is watching. And He's going to take care of you. It is, look, the times, look, if, we, if God says cross that river and take that step and we say no because I can't see it, we're kind of on our own. We're kind of on our own at that point. But as we march forward, taking the steps that God commands, searching and craving the will of God, God says, I'm with you every step of the way. And I've got you. And my will is going to be accomplished in your life. Point number three, quickly. Without faith, it is impossible to please God or to find pleasure in Him. Hebrews eleven six. But, uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Do you believe that God is? Amen. Do you believe that God is? That's a question. Do you believe that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him? Amen. Because He is. The word diligently means to search out, to crave, to investigate. As opposed to this lukewarm, apathetic Christianity that, has the, that is characterized by laziness. And, uh, and, and we wearily pursue Him. Like the things of God, they weary me. Not interested in them. Can't believe, is it Sunday already? <laughs> Tell me it's not Sunday. Yes. I gotta go to church. I really wanted to go fishing today. I really wanted to go golfing today. I really wanted to go hunting today. I really wanted to do this, that, and the other thing. But uh, I gotta go to church. Too much church. That's, that's a believer that doesn't really believe in Hebrews 11.6. That God does exist and that He is a rewarder to them that diligently seek Him. And therefore, they never experience the reward. I don't mean money. I just mean God's favor on your life and future value in heaven one day in your heavenly bank account. Do you believe that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him? Faith unlocks the door to an infinite God. And I'm almost done, folks. Faith unlocks the door to an infinite God. A divine, a divine presence whose unwavering attention and love are solely dedicated to us. To us. couple quotes for you here. I don't know who made them. One of them says, No explanation is necessary to one who has faith. And no explanation is possible to one without faith. Think about that. Faith is believing when it is beyond the power of reason to believe. Matthew 17, 20. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Be, there, be from here to there. And it will be, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Are you ready to take that amazing faith that you hold and channel it towards God? Maybe for the first time in your life, are you are, are you ready to take the very gift of faith that God gave to you? Are you ready to channel it to God and not to the world? To Satan, the prince of the power of the air, his economy, his governments. Imagine the powerful journey that could be. 
Imagine the powerful journey that could be. Let's pray. If you're here this morning without Christ, boy, I, I speak to you first in an attitude of prayer with only me talking, nobody else looking around, only me looking. If you're here without Christ today, oh my goodness, do not, do not continue down that path. As I said last week, I think there is no scenario of that pathway that ends well. Not one. Faith in Jesus Christ is our only hope for eternal life. Our only hope. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, said Jesus. Welcome Him into your heart today. If you have doubts, hey, take care of the doubts. Get it nailed down. Get the assurance of your salvation today. Nail it down and say, I know. I mean... I had a lot of doubts before, but as of today, I know. I know I'm saved. If you're here, you're a believer, and you've got heartaches and worries and concerns, and you do, and we do. This is just the way of life. It's what, it's what happens when we live in a sinful world. Have faith. Believe God. Believe that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Understand that your uncertainty... Is, is, is not the end of belief. It's actually the fact that you are...